Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Keeping It All Together, Progress Monitoring and Record Keeping Binders for the Teacher for, of Students Who Are Deaf and Hard of Hearing. We will be recording this event, and this recording has already begun. My name is Sherry Conrad with RMTC, and I'm going to be monitoring the room for, the, for our presenter. Welcome to this one-hour webinar titled Keeping It All Together, Progress Monitoring and Record Keeping Binders for the Teachers for Students Who Are Deaf and Hard of Hearing. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Felicia Massey, who's an itinerant teacher for students who are deaf and hard of hearing in Okeechobee County. She's also a certified visual phonics trainer. After the presentation is complete, we're gonna take some questions. We wanna thank Alternative Communication Systems and specifically Ann Armstrong for providing captions today. With all that business done, I wanna welcome my friend, Felicia Massey. Thanks, Felicia, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending. Today, I'm gonna to talk about progress monitoring and record keeping for the itinerant teacher. Um, what you're gonna need is you're gonna need a binder of some sort, whether it's a three ring binder, a one inch three ring binder or larger. Um, I happen to have one here. And also inside the binder, there's going to be specific tabs, which we will talk about as we go through um, the presentation. On your screen, you're going to see um, the live binder that I've created and everything will be here for you to have access that you can download and use and anything that um, I create or feel needs to be added will be uploaded as well and you'll have access to that. To start off in the binder for the for collecting data, we're going to start with um, the contact information. And in this area, you're going to find um, this is where we keep our school profile information on our student. So any home phone numbers, addresses, maybe the student's specific schedule. Um, also contact forms where there's communication between the teachers um, or inclusion teachers. So sorry. Um, and you can use any type of generic form. So here I'm going to click on here and show you a couple of generic forms that we've used. So if I happen to have to call a parent or a teacher contacts me, um, we would make notation here on these forms. The date that the person contact us, contacted us, who contacted us, um, what was discussed. Sorry. Um, and also, this is just a generic little, little parent communication log you could use. You can find them on teacher pay teachers. You could create your own. It's whatever you want to do. Sometimes we also will print off um, actual emails and stick in there if it's easier to keep that record that way. The next spot in the binder is the um, academic placement. This is the part of the binder where we house the current student's IEP. Um, any other documentation containing academic information. Um, so in here, if you're going to look over at the tab section on the side here, when we do evaluations, here are some evaluation forms that we use here at our district. Underneath that tab, you're going to see um, if you're doing an audiological reevaluation, there's a form here for that. We'll pull that up. so we can see it here. All right. So on this form, we would take um, the updated audiological information and input it here. That way, sometimes when you get information from um, current IEPs and things like that, you might not have the actual audiological info or an actual audiological um, documentation. So then that's right here for you. Um, if you're looking at eligibility, the eligibility requirements are here. Um, there's a spot on here to indicate if you need to do an Usher syndrome screening at that time. And then any results that you um, recommend. There are two forms. There's a form I just showed you there, and then there's another form. It looks exactly the same, but if you are doing a Usher syndrome screening, it goes into much more detail um, filling out that Usher syndrome part, and I'll click on it so you can see the difference. Okay. 
if either of the student has, has met that requirement age for an Usher syndrome screening, um, we will go ahead and use this form when we're determined an eligibility or reevaluation at that three year mark. So the difference between that form is right here. So you would indicate over here if you're doing the Usher syndrome screening and then it breaks it down into the areas of the actual screening for Alicia? the data that's collected. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. We're having a trouble seeing nope. the actual forms. Okay. Nothing's showing. Do we need to go back all the way to contact information? Okay, that's fine. All right. Okay. So here in the binder is the contact information. Um, this is the area where we keep the school information, school profile of the student, um, their schedules, and any contact information um, between teachers, parents. And I'll show you two, two forms you could use. Um, you can find forms on Teacher Pay Teachers. You can create your own, own form if you like. Um, this just happens to be one of the forms we can use where you would put the date, the person that was contacted you or you contacted, and the reason for the contact. And then here's another parent one that I found online, something of that nature you could use. And we also sometimes just print out the, if conversation is through email, either save it on a file, but sometimes we print them and stick them in the binder as well. The next tab in the um, binder would be academic placement. And this part of the binder is where we're gonna house the current student's IEP, um, any other educational documentation. Um, and I'll go through these specific tabs. So the first tab is evaluation and reevaluation forms. We have two evaluation forms in here. The first form go. Um, the first, this is audiological or reevaluation form. You could use it for either one. Um, and we indicate over here in this box here on the right, if it's an initial or a reeval. Um, the first part of the form, you're going to put all the audiological information off the student's current um, audiological grant gram. If you're looking at eligibility, the um, eligibility requirements for the state are here. Um, and then there's an issue here if you're going to do the Usher syndrome screening notification if the student is required to do that at that age. Um, and there's a second one here I'll pull up that actually has more information if you have to do Usher syndrome at that time. Okay, these two forms are exactly the same except for um, where the Usher syndrome screening is. So I'm going to scroll to that. So here you would indicate, um, and all of these here, I'll click on them. All these have some drop down menus so that you just select what you need. So if the student doesn't need one, doesn't need further screening, or screening wasn't conducted due to the age, um, you would choose that here. And then there's an area for if you're doing paper screening, if it was completed, yes or no. And then your results that you determined from your paper screening would go here. Uh, if you did that, had to do the on-site screening for the visual field screening, that is indicated here as well. If they passed, if they failed, if you didn't need to do it, Um, the cone adaption screening, the same thing, your data will go here and a little drop down menus to indicate it if they passed or they failed. <clears throat> and then your balanced screening data and any um, summary of your results from the screening that you had here. Okay. Um, there's also district um, eligibility worksheets here that we have. These are the first two forms are what what I fill out. 
Um, and then we actually have some forms that our district requires that. <clears throat> oh, it says internet connection. Can they see? Can you guys yes, still see can. it? Okay. All right. I know each district probably has their own forms that they need to um, use. But this happens to be the one that our district uses. Somebody else created it for us. So um, you would go through and mark what was completed, if they met eligibility, what were the actual eligibility requirements based upon the student's hearing loss, if that Usher syndrome screening was conducted. And what I do is I take those two forms that I showed previously and I turn, go ahead. Okay. What I do is I take those two, two forms that I showed previously, whichever one I use, the first one or the second one, and a copy of the student's audiological gets turned in with this form to our district. And then this just happens to be another district form that we had used in the past, but um, I thought you guys could have access to it in case somebody wanted to use it or tweak it. Um, all the students information will go here at the top. The state requirements are listed here as well. You'll see it looks very similar. I just took this information and put it on those first two forms. So this one's very simple, very basic, but it's something that you could start with if you wanted to use it. Okay, so under that academic placement, we had those evaluation forms. Some other forms we use um, here are the park and um, readiness checklist for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Usually um, we'll use this when we're getting a student for the first time to determine eligibility. And there's a variety of different checklists in here um, that you can look at to determine what's um, the best academic placement for a student. And I'll scroll through. Hey, Felicia. Yes. Hey, Felicia. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Um, we have a question from Catherine Montesino. She what do you mean by gets turned in when you were talking about the eligibility forms? that it gets who does it get turned is the question is who does it get turned into um if it's we take those forms and we give those forms to our uh, resource specialist so whoever is running the iep meeting they're the one that collects all of the um documentation for the state to make sure everything's appropriate for the students iep so any paperwork that i turn in i turn into the resource specialist okay does that answer your question okay let me know if that didn't answer your question okay awesome all right I just can't find my little scroll button here on the side for this. There it goes. Okay, so I'm just going to scan through here, looking at the park checklist. And like I said, I usually use this if we're looking at eligibility for a student for the first time, or if there's concern of a student's current academic placement and we might be looking at a different environment for them. One of the first checklists in here is the um, general education inclusion ready checklist. Um, this helps you determine whether a student would be beneficial from, um, would benefit from any inclusion support in the classroom. Um, this checklist could be completed by yourself. It could be completed by the teacher, um, just to collect that data. Um, there's also one in here for interpreting or trans translated services for the student. I usually tend to have my interpreters, if the student has an interpreter, to um, fill this out as well as myself, and then we kind of compare that data between the two. And I'll focus on things, you know, is the student um, focused on the interpreter? Do they understand the roles of the interpreter? Do they know how to advocate for the interpreter? Um, things of that manner. There's a check ready checklist for um, captioning and transcribing. If you have a student that you're thinking about might benefit from closed captioning, but you're just not quite sure, this checklist is a good checklist to go through um, and see if they're ready for that type of accommodation. And this is what this one kind of looks like. 
It's going to ask you um, what's the student ability in reading, what are their strengths and preferences, um, do they understand even what closed captioning is or how to use it. So there's quite good questions in here to, to look at to determine if captioning is going to be a best choice for your students. There's also instructional communication access checklist. Um, I totally just went blank. <laughs> All right, this one um, for communication, listening and spoken language. Are they a sign only student? Um, how proficient are they in that modality of communication? Um, I could do this myself. You could have the speech and language pathologist fill this out, um, an interpreter or a teacher to kind of give you some information. I'll ask you about expressive and receptive language, written language for the student. And then there's going to be a part where it says placement and readiness checklist for students who are deaf of hard of hearing. And it's going to break it into three, um, three areas. So the first one is preschool and kindergarten. So this is the form we would use when we're looking at students that are in pre-K or kindergarten. Um, it's going to look at their um, academic environment. So usually you go in and do an observation and I take the sheet with us. Um, and kind of fill it out to the best that we can. If we need um, input from the teacher, then of course we'll hold off on those questions. So there is one for, like I said, pre-K and kindergarten. And it's gonna focus on classroom environment, um, their learning environment, the instructional style that's going on in the classroom. Um, school culture. And then contributions from the student. You know, what are you seeing the student doing in the classroom? Um, and, and then there's one for each grade level. So you got elementary, there'll be a, um, and a secondary one as well. I'll scroll so you can see it real quick. But all three hit on the same um, areas. Oh, oh, well, for the communication one. Um, to go back to the communication checklist up here, you could also use um, data from the communication plan to fill in there as well. Where was it? Yeah, up in here. So you can use data from the communication plan as well. All right, another form we can use under the academic placement here is um, screening instruments for, for targeting educational risks. And you'll see over here in the tab, it's or the sifter you might hear, there is a pre, preschool, elementary, and secondary. So based upon which kid, your student you're looking at, um, grade levels, which form you'll use. Um, and this is the same thing. So when you go and you're doing observation, this might be another form that you take with you and fill it out. And you can see, I'll click into each one, um, depending on if it's preschool, elementary, or secondary, the questions will definitely differ. And again, the deaf and hard of hearing teacher can fill this out. You could have the classroom teacher fill it out. You could both fill it out and compare the data. It's always too good to get a view from everybody, especially secondary, if they have more than one teacher getting that input is good. For some reason, this one's not coming up. Okay, for some reason, that secondary one's not coming up, so I'll have to just double check. I'll go back and make sure it's on there before we, later this afternoon. Um, another one we'll use is the hearing itinerant service rubric. I use this form to kind of help me determine um, service minutes for students. You know, we always wonder how many minutes should we provide for our students. So I don't go 100% by this form. Um, depends on other things the student might need, but I use it as a baseline. Felicia, we have a question. Okay. Catherine Montesino writes, okay, just to be clear, 
the park is taken from Karen Anderson's book for DHH students, correct? When we need to use these forms, are we to go to the live binder and just print out these forms and then do all of these forms go into our progress monitoring binder or do we have a separate progress monitoring binder for each student? Okay. Yes, that is where those forms originated, it originally came from. And yes, you may go, sh I put them on the live binder so it was easy access just to get to it and print them off. Um, I kind of had them everywhere on my flash drive and putting even putting it on the live binder to do the presentations that I've done has made it much easier that I just open up my live binder. I know right where it is. I can download it quickly, have quick access to it. Um, the next question I believe she wanted to know was, does each student have a binder? Yes. That's why I, I had said earlier at the beginning that each student has their own um, binder that's going to house all of these things that I did that I used. I might not use all of these things that are here, but whatever I use to collect data is going to be in this binder. Um, that way I have easy access to it. If I got called at a last minute IEP, they say, hey, we got an IEP for Johnny. I can grab that binder and at least have some sort of data or information on that student in my hand when I walk in that meeting. Okay. Um, as I was saying, this is the service rubric that I use to kind of help determine service minutes. Um, you can use it again when you're going in for an observation or if you've already done an observation, you might be able to answer some of these questions um, from the previous observations you've done. Um, it's gonna ask you about the student following classroom routines, comprehension of classroom instruction, um, how were they participating when it was a whole group lesson and when it was a small group lesson. Um, it's going to ask you here about their academic performance in reading, writing, and math. Where do they fall? Um, you can look at their current grades. Sometimes ask the teachers. Um, in our district, we use um, iReady, uh, reading and math, as our district assessment. So sometimes um, I will look at that data as well and kind of just determine where we think that the student falls in these areas. Um, the language skills of the student, the receptive and expressive. Um, it's kind of hard when you have a brand new student that you have not actually physically worked with to know these. So sometimes if you happen to get some old data from records that came over from schools, you would use that there. Or um, you can get with a speech and language pathologist to help you with receptive and expressive language. We have a comment in the chat box about the park. The, um, some clarification. Karen Anderson has permission to share the park, but it was actually originally developed by Cheryl DeCon Johnson. Um, those readiness checklists were created by a team at the Children's Hospital of Boston. So Karen Anderson compiled them um, and Felicia has put them all and made them all available within the live finder as well. So that was just a comment in the okay. um, chat. Yeah, because I know you can get them online for free, like to download. So I mean, I had them on there, so we just added it. Okay. Um, all right, so you're gonna look at the student's self-advocacy skills. These are some questions that they might ask you in here. Um, are they aware of their, their hearing needs? Um, do they, how often are they attending visually? These are things that you would check in throughout in this area. And then um, your student's auditory skills. In this area, you're gonna, you know, what are they hearing in the different types of environments? So if you've done a functional listening evaluation, I would look at that data and try to answer these questions based upon using the results from there. Um, the type of hearing loss this student has and what grade level. What you're gonna do is once you, I usually just circle what I've chosen and then you're gonna add up the column to get a score. And then down here, it's based upon your score, will give you an idea of what service minutes possibly you could provide. I'm trying to think. It wasn't this one. I thought there was a part for um, interpreters, but it wasn't. I can't go back up.
Okay. So like I said before, I don't always use this number to say, okay, well, the student got a 22, so I'm only going to put the student on consult. If there's other concerns, like maybe the student needs um, especially the de design instruction in reading, they're going to need more minutes. So then if I feel the student needs maybe some more minutes based upon other things, that's where I would put other considerations and make notations there. Um, I put a tab here for resources under the academic placement, just so you had access to things you might need right offhand. Um, we have the eligibility rule for deaf and hard of hearing. Here, you also have the eligibility rule for dual sensory. If you needed those, then you can just click right on it and have to, don't have to Google search for it. Um, when you're going into your IEP meeting and for eligibility for students, the nice little handbook that RMTC sometimes gives us, um, or you can print off in hand, it's right there so you don't have to go search for it. There's one for um, students with, who are deaf or hard of hearing, and then there's also one for dual sensory. And, or I'm sorry, there's one in English and one in Spanish. And then I also put um, Florida School for the Deaf and Blind and Michigan's on there. So if you needed access to that content, it's all right there for you. All right, and I'm looking at the time, okay. So the next spot is the communication plan. And in this section of the binder, the student's individual binder is where we're gonna hold um, the communication plan. So here I've given you access to the um, fillable form of the communication plan. I'll open that up. So you have access to that there. That's a fillable form for you. Um, I also have on here the interpreter form for the communication plan, interpreter input form. So if my student um, has a sign language interpreter, I get this information from them as well. They'll fill this out for me, um, and then I use this data as we're completing the student's communication plan. Um, and here is also the self-assessment um, communication for adolescents. And I usually use this more with middle school um, and high school students. And the student gets this one. So they evaluate themselves. So for example, it might ask things like, um, is it hard for you to hear or understand when you're talking with only one person? And then they're going to tell me, you know, almost never, two occasionally, three about half, four frequently, and about you know, five almost always. So they're gonna rate themselves on how they feel that they're hearing within their academic environment or social environment. Um, and I just don't hand it to them. We usually sit down and discuss it and kind of go through each question because sometimes they need a scenario. I'm not sure, really sure what this means or they might pick, you know, the kid, my student might go, oh, well, I, I'm fine, I can hear in the cafeteria. So then we kind of talk about it and they're like, okay, well, no, maybe that's more of a four. So we kind of do this one a little bit together, but it's good to get their feedback on how they feel that they're hearing it within their environment. And then you can lead to what do you feel that they need to have access. So you're making sure that they have the right accommodations. And also there is another resource tab here for you. Um, here is um, a tab for RMTC for um, the communication training module. If you needed to do a module, there's a link for that. Um, and then the technical assistance, there's a, a PowerPoint that was there that was tied to the communication plan. So those two things are there. All right, so the next tab is gonna be audiological or medical. Um, this is gonna hold the student's current um, audiological exam from the uh, ENT or any medical, um, other medical paperwork you might need um, due to having other disabilities. In here, we're gonna have the functional listening evaluation. And under this tab I have for you, um, the functional listening of, value of the fillable form. Pull down 
So all the directions are there for the functional listing evaluation. And then the first form you see, this is gonna be the results form. And then you're gonna have your common children phrases and your non nonsense phrases. And as you fill in, let me scroll up here. As you fill in these spots, it'll go ahead and tally up percents for you. Just gonna type something. back to the top. Did do it. And it will start to plug in. It'll plug in the data automatically for you. Okay. This this functional listening evaluation, as you can see, it's pretty lengthy. So I usually use this with my middle school and high school students. And I happen to come across another one that I use with my um, elementary students. And that's what this one looks like. It's not fillable, but it's at least, it's, 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 we do it in the same type of environment we would do the other functional listing evaluation, but it's just less um, sentences for the student to have to do. Oh, the, um, the other one, okay. Um, and there is common phrases and nonsense phrases. And that one took the same sentences from the common phrases and just jumbled them up to make the nonsense phrases. And then um, to go back really quick to the fillable form up here, before you, you have to save it as a PDF you said, you have to save it, okay. It will, it will calculate the data for you, but you have to save it as a PDF file before you print it. Because if you just hit print, none of the data will be saved on there. It'll be completely blank. You have, oh yeah, print it as a PDF so that that data is on there. Um, so I will complete these forms here, whichever functional listening evaluation that I, that I choose to do based upon the student. And then down here is um, functional listening evaluation result document. It's very basic, but if, for example, if I just hand that functional listening evaluation paper to the resource specialist, they don't know how to read it. They don't, they don't, they can't look at the data to, um, to discuss it or even know what any of those numbers mean. So I just created this little generic form to where I can type up in this box right here, a summary of the functional listing evaluation and the results and then what my recommendations are. And I will attach this paper to the actual functional listing evaluation data. Um, also under the audiological um, tab in the binder, if your student um, is required at the time to do Usher syndrome screening, that's where um, this tab is. And this first one is actual website for the um, Usher, screen, Usher syndrome screening, excuse me, guide and rules. So everything's right there at that first tab. Um, and then it's broken down. So you have the visual motor behavior questionnaire. Oh, the button fell down when I was touching. Okay, so if you're going in for an Usher syndrome screening, I'm gonna print out these forms and go and take them with me when I'm um, doing that assessment with the student. So here's where this one's the questionnaire. So you would send this home with the student. So this is one of the paperwork that would go home with the student. So part of it is, part of this screening requires the parent to fill out some information. So this would be one of them. 
So that there's visual motor. There's a student question questionnaire. Should I click on one? Um, the student questionnaire, you could either send home and have them do it with their parent, or you could do it with your student. It's however you want to do it. But the student questionnaire is going to mirror one of the parents. So you're going to get a perspective of the parent, and you're going to get a perspective of the student to compare that data. There's a family history questionnaire um, that goes home as well. So if the student is required to have Usher syndrome screening, I go ahead and print out the questionnaires that need to go home to the parent and attach a letter to it just stating, we're required to do this screening, please complete these forms. Um, and I believe I have that um, sample letter attached as well if you needed it as a reference to make your own. Um, but they're all here so you can just print them quickly. And then if you have to go further into the screening, doing the balance tests, the CONAT adaption test, the visual field test, there's the actual um, forms you would take with you when you do those assessments to collect your data. Um, and you'll notice if you compared these forms to the form at the beginning when we talked about um, evaluation, the evaluation forms that had the Usher syndrome screening attached to it, they look exactly the same. So these forms here, I'm going to keep in a student's file um, so that I have it. But when I'm turning in that sheet to the, to the resource specialist, I'm going to take all of that data to transpose it over. I was trying to save on paperwork for the resource specialist not to have like a huge packet. Um, but I keep all the big, you know, the big packet just so that I have it to, to go back if we need it. So there's each one of those papers for those tests. Um, there's the parent notification letter I was talking about here. Um, let's see. I actually have three here. <clears throat> Let me open one, show you the difference between them. Um, this is just telling them that, you know, based upon the, the state rule, we have to screen for Escher syndrome and for them um, to complete those those documents that I'm sending home and that I will send an updated letter letting them know, know the results. Um, and that's what this one is here. Depending on if the parent is at the IEP meeting, depends, you know, if I mail <clears throat> or mail or send the letter home to the parent or um, give it to them at the meeting. But then here's just a little letter that shows where did the student fall? Were they at low risk in these areas? Did they pass or fail or were they not uh, assessed at all? And then there's a little drop down menu here. You can choose your reasoning based upon the results. Um, another thing that can be in that audiological medical, excuse me, is the um, children's auditory performance scale or CHAPS. Um, I've, there's two tabs here. There's one from Phonak that I've attached so you can have access to. And then um, there's this one, which is the one that I tend to use. Um, again, it's looking at um, the listening environment of the student. You know, if they're in a close, quiet setting, how are they? Um, how would they hear with this question? You know, in a quiet room with only one person present, how are they going to hear, you know, when paying attention, um, when asked a question one on one. So you can, um, we pretty much know our students, but you could also use data from the functional listening evaluation here um, and other assessments that you might have done. Okay. Um, this is a form I happen to come across at some point, which is good to take with you when you're trying to explain a student's hearing loss um, in a meeting. 
we, we understand it, but to explain it to others is kind of sometimes difficult. So it kind of can give them a, even a visual. Um, so here, So here you'll indicate the degree of the student's hearing loss. Um, and then here is gonna tell you some general concerns based upon the student's hearing loss. Sometimes what I do, because you know, students might have different um, degrees of hearing loss in each ear, I might color code it. Uh, the student has uh, 25 to 35 decibel hearing loss in their right ear. So I might shade it with a red pencil. Um, and then maybe in their left ear, they have a 30 to 35 decibel and I've shaded in blue and even shade those areas in blue to indicate to show the parent or the teacher so that everybody can understand um, how that impacts the student. Um, and then going over here is gonna tell you, you know, at soft speech at 35 decibels, you know, if the student has a hearing loss in this area, 25 to 35, these are the sounds they're gonna miss um, at that percent, you know, in conversational speech and teacher speech. And it kind of gives them an idea of, oh, okay. So it's really good just to take in to have that like data to support, to help you yeah. explain. Go back and say that sentence again. What did I say? <laughs> the internet went down. Oh, I don't even know what I said though. Just that that's a good tool oh. to have. So this is just a really good tool to have to take with you into um, an IEP meeting to help explain uh, the degree of the hearing loss for the student and how it's going to affect them um, in their academic environment daily. Um, okay, along in here, what I like to keep is um, data on um, the student's audiological reports. They're the longitudinal, the, you know, over the years, what is their hearing loss been? Um, so, have this form so that you could put the date of the audiological and then their actual the information here for their right and their left ear and then you can track that as they get new audios you put that data in there so that you can look at the previous um, audio so that you can compare it yourself to see if um, they're having some hearing loss in specific frequencies um, we also use this sometimes to for the students to compare their hearing loss on their audio so that they can see is their hearing loss um, stable, is it progressive, is it declining. And then there's a resource tab for you here. Um, some information for functional listening assessment from RNTC is here. Um, for you to register online if you need a course. I think there's also the, is the sound clip on here? I know I didn't attach that, but that might be something we can look at attaching. Um, and then also for the Usher syndrome screening, I attach for the deafblind collaborative. So if you have a student that's deafblind um, and you, or you need training on Usher syndrome screening, this is who you would go to to contact for that. Okay, all right. Moving on, we're good. Okay, all right. Assessment tab. Under the assessment tab in the students binder, um, here in our district we use iReady, so that's why this tab is here. So that's one of the things you can put in there. It's supposed to go straight to the iReady website, but it doesn't like it, that site. <laughs> um, so if you use iReady, here's some forms that you could use um, to collect data from iReady. If it's the current school year, I just automatically print out the report from iReady and put that in the student's binder. But I like to keep previous data, but I don't want to keep all of that um, paperwork. So created a form that's going to hold the three diagnostics because we do a three diagnostics beginning, middle and end. And it's going to hold that data for you. So this happens to be what that sheet looks like. So this one's for reading. So you would put the student's name in the school year. Um, the first diagnostics, the test date, what grade level they came in, or what grade they're currently in, what placement they got for iReady from doing that assessment, and then their scale score. And then you're going to do, you would do the individual domains here. And then when you go to the second diagnostic, the same information is going to go here, but the only difference is, is you're going to actually show the growth 
Did they go up in score? Did they go down in score? How much was that? So that'll keep that data. So I keep a paper for each student previous years in their binder and then the current one on top. And there's one for reading and there's one for math. There we go. Same concept. It's just one's for reading and one's for math. Um, and then I've attached on here, I know that iReady is not always appropriate for all of our students, as we know. So here's a tab for you, which it doesn't want to open, that'll send you to the link for RMTC. So if you needed justification or support of how to explain to your resource specialists or teachers or um, administration of how iReady is not always beneficial for our deaf and hard of hearing students, that um, there's a document here for you. So you would click on the testing for assessments and maybe where we go. And it's down here. Can students who are deaf and hard of hearing access or be assessed via iReady? So that's a really good document to look at. So it's attached there for you. So you have quick access to it. I know. Oh, HUD. And I just totally backed all the way out. Did I back all the way out? Hold on a minute. So sorry. Where were we? Academic? Okay. Assessment? Okay. So that was iReady. And then there's a form for um, other assessments. So we we'll like to keep data on um, students' FSA scores or FSSA scores or their PERT. Um, I'd like to keep that data as well. So this is just a very generic form. I put the year of the student and whatever that test might be. So if it's uh, ELA, FSA, we put it here with their score. So it's just a very generic form to kind of keep data on that as well. Um, next tab is curriculum. <clears throat> so in the curriculum tab um, is where I keep any curriculum data, um, whether it's expanded skills, um, if we're doing steps of success for Fairview learning, finger spelling our way to reading, any of these here that I've put, um, you could utilize. And I will keep that data under this, this tab as well. I'm going to click really quick in here under the expanded skill checklist. Um, all of the students have one of these in their binder. Um, and it's broken down into goals and strands. Um, and it has the standard attached to it. So it's broken down from K through two, three through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. Um, and I use this to determine um, when we teach expanded skills, what expanded skills have they mastered? Um, and we highlight those off. And then um, we'll tally them up down here to give me a percent. So that I know if the student is in the grades between K through two um, at kindergarten, all of those skills that are under there, they might know 20%. Um, and that helps me keep data on um, their expanded skill knowledge. And then I also use this form to help me determine um, what goals they might need for their IEP to work on too. Whichever ones they haven't mastered, we'll focus on those. Um, the next tab is the independent functioning tab. Um, here's some forms you could use to collect data on independent functioning. 
Um, this is a good one here. We use this one a lot um, for independence and self-advocacy skills. I usually do this one every year. And then um, on the student's IEP and the, under that area, I might document, um, you know, Johnny, Johnny um, is showing, you know, last year, or, you know, Johnny was, sh let's say he came in at a 2.5, but last year he was a 1.5. I would say Johnny showed growth in self-advocacy skills based upon this form. And then I would put that um, average in there and say that he's showing some independent skills. You could fill this one out as well yourself, or you could have the teacher help you fill it out. Um, and then there are independent skills uh, data forms for the interpreters to fill out as well, and they're here. And if your student utilizes an interpreter, how are they doing that? And those, those checklists help um, <clears throat> determine their independence level with an interpreter. There's a tab for social and emotional. Um, so Anything under, I would keep here. There's some checklists um, that I use. This one I use mostly with my primary and secondary students um, to figure out their communication skills within social environments. And then here is a more, um, you know, kindergarten, pre-K environment. Um, these are very simple. So like, for example, two says, do you have a good friend? And they're like, yes, I have a good friend. And I say, okay, great. What is your friend's name? So then I might try to just get a little more information and make notations out here. Can they tell me their friend's name? Um, what kind of games do they play after school? That sort of thing, not just a yes or no. Uh, speech and language tab. This is where if I have an updated um, speech and language eval, I'll keep it here if I can get a copy of it. Um, and then there's some checklists that you can get, use yourself to kind of get some feedback on their speech and language and expressive and receptive. So for expressive and receptive, I put on here, um, you could use the picture Peabody uh, vocabulary test. I'm gonna pull it up. You can use expressive vocabulary test. Um, the cast is a good one for speech and auditory training. My internet doesn't wanna work. I think it's end of the day. Um, and also, the spice kit is a good one to collect too. Felicia, we yes. have another question. Okay. Catherine Montesino writes, this is quite a comprehensive binder that's <laughs> compiled for each student. Even if we only use 50 to 80% of those materials you've provided, how would you suggest the itinerant teacher of the deaf make the best use of the progress monitoring? Is it best to compile as much as possible at the beginning of the year or just work on it weekly? I'm concerned about the amount of time this will take. Yeah, it's, it took me quite a while to get a binder for every student. So I would just start with the basics, like make sure you have their communication. What do you absolutely need in that binder first off? You're gonna need the copy of their evaluation, their audiological, their communication plan. Um, to start very simplistic. There's a lot there and I don't use all of those things. Those are just things we've compiled over the years that we have access to that I've thrown in there. And sometimes I even forget I've had some of those things. I went, oh, I forgot I had that great form. That would have been great. So just start small. Even if you, you know, I teachers, we tend to have kids clustered at schools and go, okay, I'm gonna start on this school and just work on those students and get a binder for them and then gradually. It took me a while. I think I worked on it throughout the year to kind of get their binders established. And then once their binder was established and I knew exactly which forms I needed, whether it was elementary or secondary, when that annual IEP meeting came up or I knew an IEP was coming up, I knew exactly where to go to what forms I needed. And it was just kind of replacement. Okay, here's this form from last year. Let me print a new one and collect new data. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So the last, um, the last tab in there is that speech and language. I do have one that just says miscellaneous, where like if I have a form that's signed by the parent, maybe permission to get a copy of medical records, I might stick that back there. Just something that's miscellaneous that I know I might need later, I'll stick in the back. Um, there is here on the live binder, it says forms, forms, and more forms. There's, just look through it. There's a plethora of stuff in there. <laughs> um, and if you have a question about it, you're more than welcome to email me. And say, hey, what is this form for? We didn't get to talk about it. Um, their progress minor monitoring 
binder um, tabs, divider tabs, um, are on here. It's just a Word document. You're, they're there for you to have access to. Um, and then there was just a thing for online courses for our MTC for trainings and things like that tabbed on there. So that went pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to switch places with you. Okay. Ready? So we want to thank you, Felicia, for presenting today. And now we can get all of our binders together and have that progress monitoring data ready for our IEP meetings and um, program evaluations. We also want to take this time to thank our CART provider, Ann Armstrong from Alternative Communication Services, for providing the captions today. Last and certainly not least, we want to thank each one of you for allowing us to be a part of your day today. The recording is going to be posted on the RMTC DHH website. We love hearing from you and we're happy to help in any way that we can. You can connect with us through social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can also sign up for our newsletter, Tech Notes. We would love to see your comments on social media about what you learned, but make sure to use those hashtags, hashtag RMTC DHH and hashtag FL Def Ed. As, men, as you may know, we are a Florida Department of Education, Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services Discretionary Project. And all of the services that we provide are at no cost to the participants. To continue our work, we ask that you just complete a quick survey uh, to, so that we can justify why our services are needed. We are going to put the link for the evaluations in the chat box. So if each of you could um, complete the survey right now, we would really appreciate it. If you had a colleague who missed this broadcast, or if you'd like to rewatch it later, because that was a lot of information, head on over to rmtcdhh.org forward slash TA hyphen live um, starting next week, and we will have this uploaded for you. Again, thank you so much from the RMTC DHH staff for being here today and Felicia for presenting for us today. We're going to end the broadcast now.